I'm here talking with the NSA whistleblower Bill Binney about mass surveillance. Um, we're here today because you've just given evidence to the British Parliament. Um, they're currently considering a new piece of legislation, the Draft Investigatory Powers Bill, which is entrenching mass surveillance for the very first time. What was it that you came here to tell them? Uh, my the point, main point I wanted to make was that mass surveillance, uh, it doesn't work, first of all. And basically, uh, it in fact makes their entire intelligence as well as the uh, law enforcement uh, system totally dysfunctional. Um, and what it means is they can't, what I'm talking about is they can't detect threats uh, and, and do intentions and capability kind of detection for terrorist threats or any other kind of threat. Uh, in advance. They have to wait till something happens and then they go in and analyze the data at that point. Otherwise, for law enforcement, they could retroactively analyze anybody they felt was a threat uh, and do, uh, for uh, for any reason. So even if they believed they were, they were about to commit a crime or had no evidence for it, they could still research them by, by bulk acquisition. But So that was a direct invasion of privacy with no probable cause. In, in my country, you can't do that unless under the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, you can't do that unless you have probable cause. It's a violation of the constitutional rights of that individual. Uh, so so it was, uh, really, in the U.S. side, that's really kind of a precious aspect, and we, we made sure of that because the, that was written into our Constitution because of uh, General Ritz from the King George. <laughs> so so we're kind of sensitive to that over there. So, uh, But I wanted to make sure that they understood that bulk collection, not only doesn't it do the job, but it's dis it's, it makes everybody dysfunctional. And it, it, it makes it more difficult to actually s solve uh, crimes, also to, more, more difficult in advance to stop things. So in essence, what that means, if you do this, what happens, the end result is you have to wait till people are killed in a terrorist attack. And then you could go in and look at the bulk data and all that was relevant to people who now you knew did the attack and then work out who their collaborators and, and supporters were. What kind of data are we talking about here? What, you know, what what is bulk data? What's the kind of material that these agencies are, are collecting? Uh, bulk, bulk data <clears throat> that's being collected involves email, phone calls, financial transactions like credit cards, bank transfers, uh, uh, travel, um, all all kinds of information. Now, even with the treasure map, uh, the treasure map program, uh, they're trying to map every device on the network where it is every minute of every day. What that means is they're tracking you. So they know who you are and they're tracking you based on your machine access code, things like that that will identify you specifically by these devices that you carry around, your phone and computer and so on. Uh, and, and they want to track, uh, in my view, uh, my estimate was uh, up to 4 billion people simultaneously every minute of every day. So it's it's all the information that would put together where you are and what you're doing, and and even eventually uh, they they I'm sure they hope to get to what you're thinking, so they can uh, predict intentions and capabilities, much like the movie uh, 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 Minority Report. If you remember that movie, it's kind of a it's where they had psycho psych kind of uh, psych, psychological telepathy that they could go in and see that people were going to intending to commit crimes in advance and then go arrest them before they do it. So I think that's the that's kind of the thing they want to try to get to. And so, you know, with this information, do we think that that's that's what's in the mind of of these agencies that they're that they're looking to try and detect crimes before they've committed that that they're going beyond simply a a national security remit uh, and working with with law enforcement and the police? Actually, uh, their their uh, focus is more on getting uh, money and uh, acquiring, do, doing jobs like acquiring information on people. So they have, uh, uh, they, I use three words that, that define what they're doing. They're after power, control, and money. So this is this is really important because, for the most part, people think that our intelligence agencies are focused nowadays on, on terrorism. Thirty years ago, Cold War. Today, terrorism, and and that's the exclusive remit of, of them. But but that's not quite true that's not the whole picture what else do they do they look at what else are they interested in that that they would view as as legitimate well if you really uh, every other department of government does get that auditing except for CIA and NSA so you see that means they they are given money and on the order of slightly over 10 billion dollars a year at NSA 
slightly more than that at CIA, and they're given that money to spend as they see fit, and they're not held accountable as to how they spend it, nor do we, the public, know how they spend it. Do you think that, that every capability that these agencies have should be made public? Should it, should it be, be, be declared? Or do you think that there's a line? Um, and, and if there is, where, where would you strike that? See, that's, that's where uh, a, lot of, a lot of things are being um, misunderstood, I think. Uh, what needs to be protected are sources and methods or targets, specific target names, the sources uh, and how you get that data about those specific targets. In other words, whenever you get to talk about specific successes that the intelligence agencies or the law has, law enforcement has, then you don't, that's where you, that's classified, you shouldn't discuss that. But the ability to do these kinds of things and the fact that you are doing them should be made public and it should be audited. They should be audited and held accountable for how they spend money. I mean, not auditing them sets up an entire setup for corruption and fraud. So for the very first time uh, in Britain, the agencies are explaining more honestly uh, how it is that they use these powers and, and why they want them. And for the first time, we're hearing about target development. And we're hearing about target development in the context of bulk. And it's their justification. They say, we need to collect in bulk because we need to develop new targets. And without that bulk, um, we can't do that. I'm, I'm really interested in what your view on that is. Well, that's absolutely false. Okay, in a targeted way, if they went targeted, they could define rules of association around them in terms of social networks. Uh, that's like the direct, the direct contact kind of relationship that you could recognize almost immediately right up front. Um, I'm talking about maybe 50 milliseconds later. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> once, you, once you do recognize that, you can define things that are target developments that you want to watch or follow or target or fall into what I call a zone of suspicion. That can be done right up front from a targeted approach. You don't need bulk to do that. Is this your this is your smart collection? Yes, this is, this is what we we call that smart collection. Yeah. And how is that different from bulk? That's you're you're simply viewing the information, but you're not capturing it. That's correct. But uh, first, right up front, it costs about one percent the cost of bulk collection to do this. That's one of the motivating factors that's that's pushing uh, the intelligence agencies to continue the bulk co collection because it's a money generator. I mean, imagine like Alex, General Alexander of the NSA said, we want to collect it all. Well, that's a commitment to ever-increasing amounts of data year after year. That means he's committing the governments to more and more money year after year. So that's an ever-increasing budget for his agency or any agency doing that, including GCHQ. So uh, that's their motive. I mean, that's their generating motive. And once the governments commit to that, right, then they're committing themselves and the and the taxpaying public to paying much more. Whereas a targeted approach only costs perhaps one percent of that. In the UK, we we have slightly less of the military industrial complex that, that's exhibited slightly more profoundly in, in the United States. You know, here, GCHQ are, are pretty firm in their view that mass surveillance is required. They, they say it's essential. Is, you know, why would they be making those claims? Um, surely they're not there to, to waste their time. If, if mass surveillance doesn't work, why is it that, that they want to keep doing it? For the money. I mean, it costs a lot of money to do that. I mean, my point is really simple. If mass surveillance is, that's what they've been doing for since 9-11. How well has that worked? The answer is it hasn't worked at all. I mean, every time some attack occurs, like in Paris, Madrid, London, you know, wherever, if you look closely at the data, you all of a sudden they'll start talking about, yes, we knew these people were doing this or that, or they were contacting the uh, terrorists in, in, in uh, Africa or uh, uh, the Middle East. Or they were uh, looking at sites uh, that they shouldn't have been, like jihadi advocating sites, things like that. I mean, well, well, that meant they were all known before the attack. And if they used a focused approach and focused on them because they were known, then they would have been able to see with it what they were doing and then had a chance to stop it before that happened. And that's true in every case, even before 9-11. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, in part three, we're going to be talking about the future of legislation and practice in this area.